Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come and meet to the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady Queen of Peace, pray for us. Amen. My name is Sister Maria Giovanni Paolo della Eucharistia. I am originally from Ohio. Um, I've been with the community for almost 14 years. Um, I've served in New Mexico, North Dakota, Italy, um, Seattle, Washington, and now here in uh, Kapolein, Colorado. My name is Sister Mary Anna of the Luminous Cross. Um, I grew up in Monroe, Louisiana. And I am in my third year of temporary vows, which means next summer I will make a vow again for a year, and then the next summer, God willing, I will make perpetual vows. My name is Sister Mary Liu, I'm originally from India, and um, I was with the Missionaries of Charity. I joined there, and after many years, I transferred to the Our Lady of the Most Holy Temple. I've been here just here two weeks. Uh, I've been of... here in the United States with the Missionary Society since 1996. You know, the next question, I guess, for each of you would be, what brought you to the San Luis Valley? It's fairly obvious, I guess, to some degree, but, um, you know, how was that process coming to the San Luis Valley? No, it's a surprise for me, actually. However, um, um, God's always there, right? He's the one who... Uh, but it's between our superiors of uh, finding the best, best fit that would, uh, with your gifts that you have to serve the valley. So um, I was called, I was asked in April, you know, what I thought about a transfer, and I said, well, if that's in God's will, then that's where I go. And that's where God, this is where God sent me, so it's been a good move. <laughs> Um, I was in formation for about five years, and a lot of that was in New Mexico, in Mora, actually. That's where our community was founded. And uh, sometimes we would come up to Capilene. Our sisters would go visit the sisters in the common here. We'd help out with Vacation Bible School. Just one summer in formation, they sent me up here for three months. So they knew that I kind of liked it here, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I never asked to be here. I never asked to, to, for them to send me anywhere, but when I made my first vows, this was my first assignment, and I've been here for three years, and I really like it. I was in New Mexico, Bosque, and it's a little different there because we are a ecclesial team. There is priests and sisters and laity together, and then we almost every day we come together for everything, almost everything. And I was there since 2011 until now. I used to be there on and off. I went to Haiti and Belize and England. But then then I was 2011 until two weeks ago I was there. And I I think in April or May, um, oh, I don't remember, June, that's when I um, they asked me f to come here. And same thing like Sister said, uh, I prayed about it. And I said, I see as the will of God. And I can. Are there historic ties between New Mexico and your sisterhood? Is that because you all have this, this common root in having been in New Mexico? Is that cause that's where our community actually was founded. I and mean, so um, we were gone from here for a while, but now we're back, and it's, it just seems like it's automatic home. It was in 1958 on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, actually, our, our founder, Father James Flanagan, when he, this vision um, for Our Lady Society came while he was in seminary, and he um, went to the bishop after he was ordained and said that he was called to a study community, and he told him that when we were just ordained, he said, um, why don't you wait five years? So he went back five years, and then they told him to come here to New Mexico, and that's what they he started in um, Holman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're about. He started there in New Mexico. And he was asked to leave. Something, um, do you recall? The bishop changed. A bishop has to ask changed. us to their diocese. Right. There was a new bishop. 
didn't want us there. And so he left, and then he went to Kansas City, and then just flourished. So uh, being international, we're in um, 14 different, I think it's 14 different countries and uh, several places here in the United States serving um, the deepest apostolic need in our diocese. And our founder was from Boston. That's where he was. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the previous sisterhood that was here? Is it still your sisterhood, or was that a different sisterhood that was here before? I don't know a lot, and I meant to ask somebody from here, but what I've, been pick what I've picked up in the last three years is that the Benedictines were here for quite some time, and maybe, I'm not sure if it's the 30s or 40s or whatever, until I think the high school was closed in 68 here in Kathleen, I'm not sure, and that might have been the time when they left. So they were here for a good while. Their order is still um, in, they're still here, they're in, um, I think Colorado Springs. I don't know, they're somewhere more northern Colorado, and they actually came back here last October to visit with the people here and to have a jubilee celebration um, to come visit. And one of the sisters was 96 who came, and people from here remembered her, Sister Leander. So I met her, but I, I heard that she recently passed away since October. Oh, wow. And then I heard after that, when they weren't here, there were maybe five Dominican sisters. I'm not sure if I have this all right, but they live in La Jara or somewhere around here, and they served the parish. And we, the sisters, our order didn't come. The priest came in 2004, I think, and the sisters came maybe in 2006, but all of these dates I'm not exactly sure about. Do, do you have a sense of what the role of the Benedictine sisters was in um, local education or within the community? I know that they were the ones who taught at the school here in Capilene, and they taught at the school in Antonito, I think. And um, they had religious education for people in Romeo, Antonito, Capilene, probably other places, but those are the ones that people from those places tell me that the sisters taught them religious ed or they taught them at their school that they went to. God was calling me back when I was in grade school, but I wasn't, you know how they say God knocks at your door? Well, I think he was knocking at mine, but I wasn't answering. So, and people would call me, you know, they would call me sister and I would tell them to stop it, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me, especially my, um, I had a cousin that was a priest um, and his seminarian friends would say that to me and they would um, call me sister and I would get angry with them and everything. Um, and then when the Lord finally spoke to me and I said yes, and I'm so glad he persevered, I am... Um, I come from a divorced family, so I had a lot of anger, and I think that's why I was blocking that and not answering, because I wanted to do what I wanted to do, and uh, when you tell God what you want to do, he laughs at you, okay? So I'm sure he was laughing um, on several occasions of um, different things. Uh, number one was when I graduated high school, I wanted to burn my gray, have, uh, gray um, uniform, and now I wear gray for the rest of my life, so see what I mean? When you tell God, God your plans, he just laughs at you. Um, and I knew I wanted, he wanted me to serve his people, and I thought it was to be you know, a nurse, so I was thinking maybe that's what I need to do, but um, unfortunately it wasn't that. Um, and when he called me to be a sister and he spoke to me from the tabernacle, um, I didn't realize that's what he was doing, but it was. And, um, you know, until you find where God's calling you, you know, you, you persevere. So I just got, he persevered with me in uh, knocking at my door and that I finally opened it. Um, that's where the peace is. When you open that door, you say, okay, I'll do what you want. I was visiting um, the Josephine in Columbus, Ohio, because I'm from, from Ohio, and um, I walked into the chapel there and I knelt down, and within 15 seconds, the Lord spoke to me from the tabernacle. I had not a clue that was happening. I just know I just burst into tears, and I just cried, and I'm like, oh, I've got to stop because I'm in a seminary. But I would go back there all the time because there weren't sisters in habits. They were in street clothes, and I wanted um, a habit in sister. You know, when somebody, uh, you know, an order in a habit, and so I just kept going, and that's, the Eucharist has always been in my life because that's where, you, when you open your heart to God and let Him talk to you, 
I mean, everything just, and it was just so peaceful. You've gone to adoration before, and, and you're in that adoration, and, and God's talking to you, and you're like, oh my gosh, I just feel that peace, that that love that's coming through. And then um, he showed me, you know, all those different times that he was calling me, and I wasn't listening. I wasn't listening to him at all. But it's it just felt like a bolt of the Holy Spirit just, just going in, and you just feel it, you know, you just wow, what was that, you know, until you realize that was the Holy Spirit and it was God talking to you. And uh, so ever since, you know, my time in the chapel, and I even have a little, little um, altar in my room where I sit there and I, uh, I pray because I just, it's so peaceful. It's just so peaceful. And that's here in the valley, that's what it is. It's very peaceful here, um, you know, and having that, you see God's country everywhere you look. I tell my friends, my new neighbors now are the cows. <laughs> But, I, you know, it's beautiful. Our order is called the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, and it's S-O-L-T for short, so SOLT. Sometimes we say SOLT sisters or whatever. But um, I didn't want to be a sister. <laughs> God was very patient with me, too, and um, probably for 12 years. Upon reflection, I could trace a journal entry back to sophomore year of high school, but I didn't even know it was there until after I was in formation and looking back through my stuff because you have to go through everything. I was like, because I had a teacher, an English teacher at my Catholic school, and she had been in formation, but she had stepped out of the convent to discern, and she was actually dating a man, and we all knew this, but in one of my journal entries, I put, um, what if God wants me to be a sister? <laughs> so I found that a long time ago. But I wouldn't have thought consciously I really thought about it at all until I was actually dating someone at uh, senior year of college and um, for about two years. And just on and off, I could push the idea out of my mind, but it was still there in the back of my head. Maybe God wants me to be a sister. And that's the way I put it at that time. I mean, that's what, what the phrase was in my head. Maybe God wants me to be a sister. And... I just kept ignoring that for a while, and I even said yes when he asked me to marry him, which um, I shouldn't have, but um, we grow, we learn. But I was engaged for four months, and by at the end of four months, I, was, I knew that God did not want me to, that wasn't his will for me to marry him. And so I, he gave me the courage to give the ring back. But, um, so for the next seven years, I kind of, I grew in my faith because I was like, oh, there's someone other than me because that was not me saying don't marry him, basically. And I knew, I knew God and I, I loved him and I had faith since I can remember, but this was a new, a new level, I guess, to know that God might have a will for me. Nobody had ever really told me that, that I knew that there were different vocations, but I didn't know, nobody ever said discern what your vocation is, so I hadn't done that. And anyway, um, I got to know Jesus more in adoration, more slowly, more and more. My uncle was a great influence, and he went to daily mass, and he went to um, adoration, and started praying the rosary for the person that I was going to marry. Um, and then that's just turned into every day, and then it's turned into four days so in religious life. But let's see, so when I was 28, I went to Steubenville to learn my faith. I wanted to learn my faith. And um, there I was still kind of fighting. It's kind of like, ooh, maybe I will get married. Maybe, maybe God wants me to be a sister. But anyway, finally, nothing was working out. So I, I remember I was reading Mother Teresa's Come Be My Light. And it was a very difficult book, very deep and dense. And I never finished it. But it was during the time I was reading it that um, uh, I felt like God said, no, I had this idea. If I, maybe if I look into religious life, maybe then God will let me get married after that. So it's kind of like bargaining there. But um, so then, uh, what do you do? Where, what order would I go to? Well, Mother Teresa has been my hero my whole life. So I wrote to her order in August. And um, they wrote back to me from New York, where you can do a come and see. And they said, we're full right back at December. So I wrote it December, and they said, we're full right back in May, full of, of accepting people to come and see. But by the time May came, something else had already happened, so I never wrote back in May. Um, in March, from Steubenville, Ohio, it's a Catholic college, um, 
they had a mission trip to North Dakota, so I, I had actually discerned. They told you to discern. So that was the first thing I discerned. Ask God, what do you want me to do? Which mission? Which of these 12 mission trips do you want me to go on? And I went to North Dakota, and that's for, for a week long, and I met the soul community there, priests, sisters, and laity working together at a school called St. Anne's. And um, I remember on that mission trip, in my head, thinking, uh, I could be a soul sister. And then my next thought was, what are you saying? <laughs> Still was fighting this, but um, came home, back to Steubenville, praying in the chapel, like, sister, just not about anything in particular in front of the tabernacle. And I heard God say, I want you to be a soul, sister. And for the next five minutes, everything in life made sense. It was just a different experience than I'd ever had before. And um, so that was just a real experience that I could keep. I knew that that happened, because this is call, God's calling for me. Then then I will do this, and then Our Lady gave me a gift of a tiny bit of joy, and ever since then it's been growing. So. For me, my beginning was, I can remember when I was very little, um, when the, I think my mother, when she does something, she asks, what do you uh, want to be when you grow up? So I don't know where I got idea, if I don't know if I think that, I just, told her I want to be a sister, so I don't know where I got that uh, when I was five, but then I um, went to school and uh, and then in the school, um, we for the holidays we have retreat by the Capuchin. So one of the things that touched me was uh, from the St. Matthew's Bible where Jesus says when they asked him question that the Lord where you live, said the foxes are there and the birds of they have their nest, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So when that was explained, I was so touched by that and I wanted to be like that. So when I, at the seventh grade, I went to my parish priest and ask, asked him that I want to join him um, to be a sister. He told me to continue uh, my studies and I did. And when I finished my high school, so I knew my mom's sister, her aunt's two sister-in-laws, they were serving, helping the orphanage, and I don't know where I heard, I, my idea was that they go to house, house to house and they didn't have a place to stay. They stayed wherever they went. I don't know where I heard that. So I wrote to them, I said, uh, I want to be like you, uh, and so please help me. So. They were with mother, with mother Teresa. I didn't know that, and I never heard about mother. So <laughs> the next thing I know was I got a letter. I think they went and spoke with mother because she doesn't. I wrote in my language. I think they must have explained to mother in English, and so I wrote a letter saying all that I need to take, and there I had to go through exam, uh, X-ray, different for the health. And, and to go where to, for the next, was in Madras, I sh should go there with all the requirement. So that's what I did, I went there and I joined. And I was sent to, okay then, okay, I became a sister, an active sister, because mother has, I'm just making it short, uh, with us for the sisters and priests and brothers. The sisters are contemplative and active branch. And I was in the active branch, uh, I was in 1977 to Africa, Tanzania. Uh, they were mother was starting the missionaries of charity were starting a new ship there. So I was one, of, four of us were sent from India to join the sisters. There were seven of them there in Tanzania. So I went there and I loved it. I enjoyed it, and I knew what I'm doing for Jesus. And mother would come message. She give us instructions and. So after, for the final years, we had to go back. They were, the missionaries of charity called it tertianship or the, um, the tertianship, I think, for the final preparation for your final work. So I, 85, went back to Calcutta. I did um, make my final work, and I was sent back to Africa, and from there, I went to South Africa, and there, my dad had an accident, and so I wanted to go. Mother was in India. 
my uncle is a priest, so he asked me if I want to go. I said yes. So I, he asked me what I need to do. I said call mother and get permission. So he did call, but she was in China. So she spoke. He spoke to the assistant, and she spoke to the regional, but then nothing happened. So <laughs> I got kind of upset because my dad was in ICU. He was dying, and my younger, he was calling me every day, preparing me for his death. So uh, at that time, I decided <laughs> I not, I'm going to go home, and I will do the work whatever way I can. I won't be able to do like in the society. So I told him I need, I want going home. So they sent me back to Calcutta, um, and at that time, mother was there. So then I went, spoke with mother, and she said. That's, there is no problem, my child. You can go. You can stay. Go stay as long as you want. So I was happy. <laughs> and then she told me she didn't send me right away. I think that was good. She sent me to the contemplative branch. So I went there for a month. So the first thing, when I went, there was a sister preparing for her renewal, and she was the contemplative. They have three hours of holy hour, and they go out for an hour. So I was. She needed to write her renewal letter, so she asked me, somebody asked me if I could stay there. So I was there before the Blessed Sacrament, it's very close, more close, uh, close than here now. So there I really, I felt uh, really so peaceful and I came to understand, not just there, it took a little while, understand, because Mother always say you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus, and do you have that? Um, so there I came to grow more in the personal relationship with God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Before in the active work, I enjoyed it. I was doing everything for Jesus, but I didn't have that personal relationship. So after a month, I went home, and uh, before I was, when I was going home, I before I saw mother, my plan was to go home and stay, not to come back. <laughs> but after this one month, I went home and I was with my father and he was getting better though. He, he was in coma for 12 days and he came back. And they did say someone, all the people were praying because they were getting ready for his um, burial and stuff. So, so then I went back and uh, then I asked your mother to continue to be staying with the contemplative friend. So she gave me permission, I stayed and for a year. And then I asked her uh, to be transferred to the contemplative. So I was transferred to the contemplative. But in the contemplative, they just go out for, for only an hour to be with the people, whoever they meet or visit in the hospital. But they have three hours of holy hour, more prayer, meditation. So I wondered a little more, I wondered like half and half. So, <laughs> so when, and from there I was sent to New York uh, with the contemplative branch in New Jersey. And that's where I, and there was, when I was in India, I met also a sister who came from Cuba who had the same um, kind of desire. So then uh, we together uh, asked for permission for something like that with the missionaries of charity. So um, uh, the, the sister in charge of the Kandamrati sister in the she passed away last year in June. She said, um, if you want that, you need to go get a bishop and find. So uh, we were, we did that. It took a um, long time, but kept cutting it short. We were in Carlsbad, starting to do that uh, with the permission. And um, but after a year or something, um, the bishop told us that we need to go from scratch, or we need to go back to the, or find an, another order to be attached to it, or go back to the missionaries of charity. So we decided to go back. And and while I was in India. From here, then I was sent back to India. Uh, Sister Nirmal asked me if I am happy. I said, Is it, I am happy, but I am still looking for the same thing. So she gave me permission to look, and the other sister she had met for the 
Silver Jubilee of the Contemplative Brain to members of the result and they explained to her how, what they do and so she sent me all the detail and so I wrote to them and um, they asked me to go to Rome and the Missionaries of Charity sent me to Rome and that's how I got here. <laughs> It's a long trip to the Sunday yeah. spot. <laughs> when you think of Mother Teresa, what comes to mind? What, what do you most remember about her? Uh, very powerful in everything. Um, she's so kind and she sees every person. She takes individual um, care for every person and she will meet whatever the needs are. Yeah. Yeah, and then she's the, I mean, people like some other women want to be priests and things like that. And Mother always would say, if somebody would be the priest, it would be Mother Mary, because she was the one. And she just stayed there at the back, always supporting everyone, Jesus and the disciples, everything. And that's what the role of a woman, not to be a priest. That's different. Can you just explain what is the meaning behind the garb that your sisterhood wears? Our habit. Mm -hmm. Our habit was the um, vision that our um, founder um, received um, grace, simplicity, but when you add colors, they all become gray. So we kind of like um, to set that and then if you could just kind of explain the stages, like where you start and then to your final okay. vows. And I think it might be a little different in some of the orders. Some of the things are the same in the orders, but in our order, um, there were three months of aspirancy, and that just means you um, want to be with the sisters and see what they're like, what, what it's like, and you get to still wear colors <laughs> or not your habit you get to wear a colorful skirt and shirt or whatever but you're um so that was three months and then um if if everybody decides to go on then because it's a dialogue between the four maters and the person and god um the next year would be a year of postulancy so you're still postulating <laughs> is this what god's call for me and in our order we wear a gray skirt and a white shirt and still no veil, and we have a, a chain with the miraculous medal on it for postulancy. And then, um, then you become a novice the next year. There's two years of novitiate, and the first year of being a novice is more active, and you go do the works, go do your apostolate, and, oh, sorry, when you become a novice, you receive a habit, and a white veil. And you still have your miraculous medal, correct? <laughs> okay. And um, I was sent to Seattle, did my apostolate there for a year. And then your second year of novitiate is more contemplative. And what Sister Leo was saying that our order is, um, but I think this is for all orders, a novitiate of active and a novitiate of more contemplative, canonical novitiate. But our order is contemplative active. So some orders are active and some are more contemplative, but our orders contemplative active, our actions flow from our prayer ship. And um, so second year of novitiate, I was in New Mexico in Ullman. Um, very quiet, very different than I'd ever done. Lots of prayer, lots of silence. And it was very beautiful because you're preparing to, um, when you make a vow, you're your, uh, Jesus is becoming your spouse, and so you're preparing for that. Um, and so, and I learned that a spouse is someone to whom you give your whole self. So Jesus is becoming, and he gives his whole self to me. So then, after the second year of novitiate, um, then it, we get to uh, make a vow <laughs> for one year. So it's called temporary promises, I think, in our order, and then I've done that for, okay, and then you make a vow for a year for five years, and on your fifth year, God willing, if you don't need more time, um, you make a perpetual vow. 
And at what point do you does the veil become sorry, gray? That's right. When <laughs> I made my first vows, um, my veil became gray, or I received a gray veil and a crucifix. And then when you make your perpetual vows, you receive in our order. The scapula, which we're not wearing. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's a scapular goes over your scapular <laughs> bone, I guess, and it's a cloth that goes in the front and the back. It's like our mantle of Mary, our mother's mantle over us. And ours has the symbol of the Trinity, three circles with the symbol of the Father, um, like his hand in blessing, and the cross for Jesus, and the Holy a dove for the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And that's what the per perpetually professed sisters wear every Mass and every special occasion but not on a day-to-day -day basis all day long. And they receive an interior sign. What is it? It's a medallion. Um, Spouse of the Trinity? Yes, that's what okay. And one thing, I can't remember what the other side is, but we receive that, and you wear that with your scapular. Okay. What is a typical day in, in the convent here in San Luis, or in, okay. in the valley? In the, in the valley, okay. So in the morning on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, um, we leave here at quarter till at 6.45, and we go to over to St. Joseph's here in Coupling, and we're with um, some, very few, but some of the uh, members of the community, and, and our priest, Father Toro, and Blair, who's one of our lay members, and we have adoration together, and then um, we have um, about 7.30, we have morning prayer, and following we have Mass. And after Mass, we come back here and we have breakfast and do whatever we need to do, um, maybe go visiting somebody or um, whatever our um, work is that we have, right? Um, we have uh, specific days that we cook, so if it's your cook day, you can prepare for that or whatever. Um, at 11.30, we have um, our... Um, midday prayer, our rosary, and our office of reading. And then after we have lunch, and then you have a little bit of free time between there. At 4.30 we have um, evening prayer, and um, maybe a spirit, spousal exercise or a spiritual exercise. Um, uh, two days, one, uh, spirit, spousal exercises on Monday, and spiritual exercises on Thursday. And then the other days we have um, liturgy prep. So we either read or we read and share um, what the readings mean to us or what we've received out of the readings. Um, and I teach CCD on Sundays, um, third and fourth grade, a challenge with their cute little kids uh, over here at St. Joseph's and Kathleen. And then I go to La Jara after that and work with these group. And I really enjoy working with the youth here. Um, awesome, awesome kids. Um, and on Wednesdays, I help with our CIA. And I like to talk, I, you know. So we go visiting. We go visiting people, and, you know, they want to do things for the sisters, so they'll call and ask us to do things. And um, we went um, a few weeks ago, and then again, kind of the other day, we went um, gleaning. Cleaning. We did that. That was pretty cool. I've never did never done anything like that before. So that was kind of fun. And we have potatoes for the year. I <laughs> think. But um, so it's um, it's a slower pace than what I had previously done. I've done lots of things, but um, whatever God has in store, you know, I'm ready to go out there. And what What is some of the work that you do in the community? What are some of the the social issues that you see within the community? Well, one thing I am going to say, we, we talked about this with, um, they always say, oh, you're a sister, where's your ruler? <laughs> okay, we've always heard sisters hit with rulers. And perhaps that happened back in the day, but, you know, and it wasn't just sisters. I'm sure that the lay, you know, did the same thing, but we're, you know, it was always the sisters, oh, I get hit on the knuckles with this and that, and I always tell the kids, well, then they must have been bad. That's all I can say. But um, we're not that way, you know. I'll speak for our soul community. We're very loving, and um, we do anything to um, comfort a child in any way. You know, I just, um, 
from Texas to Seattle and, and to here, there's so much brokenness. And I guess coming from a broken family myself, I can sense or I see that a lot. So I'd like to give to those children. Uh, I was blessed to have great a great family that could hold it together because we were all there in the same uh, you know community. But here, you know, you have um, a lot of kids in the world that have um, siblings. Maybe the same mother, but all have different fathers, or and it's just so much um, out there that um, you just want to show them that you love them and, and and let them know that you're there for them. It's the spiritual mother who we are is representing our blessed mother here. So that's what I always tell the kids. Now, the priests represent Jesus, and we represent Mary. Do you think Mary would hate Jesus with a ruler? Of course not. So we don't either. So. <laughs> First, I'd like to clarify the nun and sister. Mm -hmm. Nuns are cloister. Okay, so what, uh, they probably don't even know about the cloister, to be quite honest, because uh, we're blessed to have cloister sisters that pray for us 24-7. Uh, to know that we're being prayed for all the time is a true blessing from God. I mean, I, I really believe that. And it, sisters, of course, were, you know, the apostolic contemplative or contemplative apostolic, whatever that vision is for each community. Um, so um, I just wanted to clarify that because I don't think people understand that, but I'd just like to put that out there. So, Sister Leo, go ahead. Can you turn? <laughs> <laughs> Any misconceptions about sisters? Um, I think maybe sometimes they associate us with Muslim because of probably yeah. the things. So they will ask. I had, I think in Africa they asked, had asked like that. So then I explained to them that we are the spouse of Jesus Christ and and the, we cover our um, showing that we are not of the world, but we are set apart for the consecrated life for God or for God. We were wondering, as a sister, what is the biggest sacrifice that you've made to be a part of this life? We all agreed, I think. <laughs> yeah, leaving the family. Oh, I thought, yeah. oh, I thought you said marriage and family. Well, oh, marriage okay. also, I mean, yeah. yes, but, you know, that, I just have to, you know, there was a little girl that said to me, but you're not going to have any children. And I said, but you and all the children in the world will be my spiritual children. So we do have children. You know, it's nice. I remember someone saying, well, that, this child is crying. I can give it back to your mom, and I'm done, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a little joke there, but, you know, it's we don't have our, by, you know, our own children, but having all the children become our children. And the church teaches that marriage and family is a high, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say the greatest good because um, some people are called to be single, but on a natural level is very great good. And the only reason um, to forego that is what if you're called to be single or if you're called to be a priest or religious um, and just the different way that God wants us to gather his family together. So. And then, Sister had a good point on the social media, but Saint jo Pope John Paul II, um, Saint. Saint. <laughs> and in Vatican too, there's a whole... Um, document on the media and how it can and should be used for good to spread God's love and um, some people are using it in that way and that's great. I'm on Facebook. I was inspired by one of our priests, Father Scott Rosser. He had a Facebook page and he wrote things about God on it and I was like, that's cool. So I did get a Facebook page and I tried to share things about the Eucharist or my sister always put something about Mary on there. I'm so thankful for my sister Katie who does that. and. Um, when I said, happy birthday, Mary, I think 12 of my friends, some of that I were surprised, liked it. And I was like, oh, good. <laughs> so, yeah. So it can be used for the good. I have Facebook, too, and email, and, and used for um, whenever necessary to spread the love of God. Do you, from a day-to-day, -day, you know, just in your daily habits, do you... It sounds like silence is a moment of reflection for you. Do you ever miss, you know, kind of the, the busier world of the city? Or I mean, coming from a place like Seattle to here must be a big change? Or No, I don't miss the traffic. 
I do not miss the traffic. If you had to be somebody we're in a half hour, you better leave about an hour early. Here, you know, it's like 13 minutes from the hair. You can leave and be there in 13 minutes. It's an excitement, you know. No traffic. That's one blessing. Um, the people were beautiful, but traffic, no. <laughs> Aside from your neighbors, the cows. The cool. neighbors, the cows, that's right. <laughs> What were some of the adjustments that you had to make coming to this new community? Was it really different than previous communities? What similarities have you experienced? Um, more rural than what I've um, been at, uh, where, I, you know, where I've been. And I guess that's just coming from Seattle. But um, yeah, I can adjust really anywhere I go. You know, God gives you that grace to adjust where he puts you. You know, you're going to adjust and you're going to um, really be able to serve the community um, with your gifts that he's given you. So um, coming from Seattle to here, um, it's quieter. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, a lot more... Um, peace of mind, because uh, you have time to reflect and, you know, just look out my bedroom window and see the mountains. I reflect Jesus being in the mountains in prayer or giving the, you know, the apostles the Beatitudes or, you know, just whatever. Um, and his kind, you know, he created all these beautiful things and how we can take things for granted and don't realize the beauty that he's given us freely. Um, it's beautiful to experience that here now.